Hi folks, welcome to today's edition of My Life with Robert Burns. We're pleased you could join us. Um, if you've watched our video cast before, you'll know that I'm here with Jim Thompson. Hi Jim. Hi Douglas, hi everybody. Jim's a friend and colleague from Newcomen at Burns Club. Uh, we're stretching our horizons a wee bit today um, and that we want to blather with somebody connected with Robert Burns, but maybe in a slightly different way to some of the people we've spoken to before. So to tell us about his life with Robert Burns, please welcome Farmer Bryce of Mosquito Farm. Hi Bryce. Hello Douglas, hi Jim, thanks very much for having me on today. Uh, hello internet, it's uh, great great to be watched by you, wherever, wherever you might be. Um, as, as Douglas said there, um, I'm known as Farmer Bryce on this crazy world that we call the internet. Um, and uh, I'm farming at Mosquil Farm, uh, once the home of, of Robert Burns and his brother Gilbert, of course, in 1784. And um, aye, so I'll just, I'll just run, run through what's, uh, what's happening in modern day Mosquil. Um, so me personally, I'm uh, Bryce Cunningham. I'm, uh, my, my family has been farming here at West Mosquil since 1948. Uh, and that was when my grandfather Bobby, he came here with 28 Ayrshire cows. Uh, we wanted to start his, his farming life and uh, met my grandmother a few years later and uh, you know my, my family then sort of grew from there. Uh, my two aunts and my father uh, then took over uh, and then here I am today at uh, <laughs> being the farmer. Um, so my, my story is I was born here at West Mosquil which is actually the neighbouring farm to East Mosquil where, where Burns was and um, when I grew, grew up I had absolutely no interest whatsoever in farming. In fact I actually remember when I turned 16, left the school and I said to my dad, Dad there's no way I'm standing underneath the arse of a cow the rest of my life, I'm going to work with cars <laughs> and, uh, and went and bought to Mercedes Benz for 10 years. Um, through, through what did that, you do with them? Uh, so um, I, I started off as an apprentice technician with Mercedes, um, I, so I tried to go up the rank, ranks, um, being, being quite a determined person, my first week I decided that I was going to become a diagnostic technician because the diagnostic technicians were the ones that got to work in the fancy cars and got to drive them, so uh, I decided that, that was going to be me, so four years later I became actually, believe it or not, the youngest diagnostic technician in the UK at the time for Mercedes. Um, and then, being more stubborn, I decided that I wanted off the tools and I wanted into management. So, um, about eight years after I started at Mercedes, I went into a sort of lower level management. Uh, my eyes set on trying to become a, a general manager, then a regional manager of Mercedes-Benz dealerships. And it's, uh, it wasn't to try and get the big fancy wages or anything like that. I just really wanted a company car so I could, <laughs> I could run it back. Um, so I so, so that, that was my life at Mercedes. Um, there was one day, actually, believe it or not, eight years ago this week, um, I got a phone call to say that my father was, was unwell, my grandfather had recently been diagnosed with a terminal condition and uh, my grandmother a couple of months before had, had had a fall and she was disabled and uh, at that time all three of them were the three partners in the farming business. Um, so I decided I was going to take a few weeks off from my work to try and go home and help out, see what, was, see what the kind of lay of the land was and we discovered that my, my grandfather had a terminal heart condition, my father had terminal cancer. Um, and both of them only had a matter of months to live. Um, so that, that was my career at Mercedes-Benz over. I decided that I wanted to stay at home, uh, take over the family business and, and see what I could make of it. Um, and in the same year, uh, we actually got the chance of taking on the lease of East Mosquil as well. So I got the chance to not just farm West Mosquil, but also East Mosquil. So today we've actually fa farming and, and leasing both farms, which is where the, the Mosquil brands now came from. And, and I finally got the, the chance to, to see a farm, Robert Burns' farm. So that was a, a big... <laughs> Um, so just to give you a, a, a whole story into to what we do, we supply, today we supply milk, we supply milk all across Scotland, um, we deliver all the way from here in Mochlin all the way up to Aberdeen and Inverness to other dairies, uh, we supply only organic milk, we supply milk from our own farm as well as five other organic farms in Scotland and uh, we don't use any single use plastic, all of our milk it goes out in reusable cartons which means that we don't have the environmental aspect of single use plastic going into landfill or, or, or being thrown out or, or littering etc so we're all reusable packaging and, um, and we also process our milk in a very different way which, uh, which brings a unique flavour of raw milk from the cow to the consumer but it's still pasteurised to, to sort of meet Scottish laws and, and sort of, of be safe under, under the, the legal system's eyes um, now the reason we've got this, this business today, it wasn't always like this, uh, so back in 2013-2014 when I'd just taken the business on, we were milking 150 cows here, uh, we were actually milking them four times a day and uh, I was very much farming under my father's vision and that vision was to have the perfect Ayrshire cow 
and the perfect Dairshire cow would produce the most amount of milk that he could get from it because that was the most efficient way that, uh, that we could farm this deal and, and pay the rent and keep the keep the business moving and it worked for my father very very well for many years using that operation however at the end of 2014 uh, we had a bit of a perfect storm uh, what happened was my, my, my grandfather had died in 2013 in 2014 my father deteriorated and he he died in october 2014 and in the same month, the milk price collapsed that, were, that was being paid to us. So our milk price went from 27 pence per litre. Uh, within a few months, we were down at 9.7 pence per litre. And in big numbers, that meant that between the f my first 12 months of farming, I lost just over £100,000 in income. And, uh, and then the bank turned around and said, we're really sorry, you're a tenant farmer, you're making massive losses, you have no experience of farming, we're going to pull the plug on you. And um, and basically that was it, we, we were left effectively bankrupted and we really had to change things. So I sort of tried, tried to rack my brains and uh, and see where we could go and all, all I could really do was, because we're tenant farmers, we didn't really have anything to sell. Um, so we ended up selling most of our cows. We sold everything other than 28 cows and it just so happened to be 28 cows was the amount of cows my grandfather came here with in 1948 to start his farming career and, and grow his family. Um, so that was a, a great connection for me, but albeit I'll, I'll at the time I didn't really realise it. Um, and you know, I was, I was left there after the sale with these 28 cows. We'd sold our fancy machinery and my tractors and everything. We were left with an old rickety tractor and a few old bits of machinery to try and farm these 28 animals. And then we get the extra blow where our new milk buyer had told us that if we didn't grow our heads held significantly over the next year, they wouldn't be able to buy our milk. So it left us in a position where with no bank support, with very few cows, we'd know how to sell our milk. Oh, yeah. the, the idea came to me that, uh, that we could, you know, we could, we could ask our local community for help. So what we did was we installed a pasteuriser and we started brewing the milk and pasteurising the milk very slowly. It actually started off. Um, you know, the, the, the 40 gallon milk cans about that size that they would use in the 50s and 60s. So we actually still had them lined about for my grandpa's day. We would milk the cows into them, we would carry it about 200 yards, pour it into a pasteuriser, wait four hours and then bottle it one at a time out the bottom of this, this pasteuriser. And if you can imagine, it was just like a big turn. So we're pouring this thing in the top, waiting four hours and then bottling it one bottle at a time just to try and keep the farm going. And, uh, and you know, actually we were very, very lucky but it, it worked tremendously. Uh, but when the local community really got behind us, we started selling into shops and coffee shops round about. Um, but it, it still wasn't quite enough to, to keep us going. And then, just by chance, we had a, a meeting in Glasgow with a coffee shop called McCune Smith. Uh, they, they really wanted to support a small family farm because uh, they, they found that they were, they were really struggling to do so in Glasgow. They, they could only really buy milk from large processors and, and the milk quality wasn't what they were looking for as a specialty coffee shop. And, uh, and it just so happened that, that we went up there, they made a coffee with the milk that we gave them and, uh, and they come round and they say, we can't believe it, this, the, the milk that we're using in this coffee is complementing the coffee beautifully. And the microfoam, so you know, you know if you've been to a specialty coffee shop, you get microfoam on top with the little bits of latte at and, uh, and the baristas always pride themselves in how well they get this microfoam to stabilise and, and to sort of perform if they're doing the latte art and making the, the kind of fancy shapes with the coffee. And it just so happened that our milk, because we were using Ayrshire cows, because they were mainly grass fed, and because we were using this really slow method of pasteurisation that worked really well and allowed the, the microfoam to stay there really st with great stability. So the, the, cafe, the, the cafe owners, Dan and Harry, they went round about Glasgow and told the coffee shops of this new milk that they had found. And um, you know that's, that was where it sort of went from there. So we started supplying lots of coffee shops in Glasgow. We were able to save the farm and start repaying the debts. That, uh, that we had accrued when, when the milk price collapsed. But, um, but ju just going back to, to the milk quality and, and sort of why we chose this way of pasteurisation. Um, so if, if you don't know the dairy industry at all, um, it's a very efficient industry in how it treats, it treats milk. So what happens is milk's picked up from farms and taken into a factory. The milk then goes from being raw milk, it goes through a massive pasteuriser, which is effectively just a, a big long chain of pipes that, that heats and cools the milk. And it can basically get the milk from one side of the factory into a finished tank and ready for bottling in a matter of minutes. Whereas, you know, we, we chose this system where it's very slow pasteurised and it's, it's uh, you know, it takes time and but you get a much better quality product at the end of it. And what gave me the inspiration of that is, I mean, actually, actually in a, I wouldn't make any apologies for it, but it came down to marketing. And that marketing was, we're farming Robert Burns' farm. We have Ayrshire cows, they're eating grass. It's the farm, it's the cows that Burns himself would have farmed that are a, a, a similar version of them anyway. 
when, he, when you knew that Bums' mother, Agnes Brown, was a cheesemaker, and she made a Dunlop cheese from her Ayrshire cows and loved them very much, and I thought, what if we could replicate the milk that Bums himself would have drank from Miss Gale Farm? And that was the whole reason that we went down that route with the slow pasteurisation. That's why Robert Bums is on what we're low today. Um, and that's what really started us off. And it just so happened to be the fact that we pasteurised in that certain way, allowed it to work very, very well in speciality coffee, which was my main business today. So that, yes, that's that's a, a kind of brief story, if you like. <laughs> um, in 2016, uh, I thought I would, I would take that one step further, uh, so the Burns connection came a bit further. And one of my favourite uh, lines in the poem that, he, that he'd, he'd written was in Tia Moose, when he said, I'm truly sorry man's dominion has ruined nature's social union. And as I was getting more and more direct with my customers, as I was selling more milk to customers and, and listening to their concerns and hearing what they were saying, um, and also it's, it was also the same time that the environmental movement really started and veganism really started to come onto social media and, and everybody really started to make noise about it. And we started looking at our farming practices. We were using fertilisers, chemical sprays, we were cutting uh, hedges very, very tightly down, we were grazing grass right down to the soil and hoping it would come back very quickly. And it was just, uh, yes, you know, it's, and, you know, that, that's the way that, that farming has become. It's become very efficient in, in the main way. However, when I started thinking about it, you know, Burns himself would have been an organic farmer. And, and not, not through choice, you know, fertilisers and chemicals weren't invented back then. There was no tractors, there was no hedge cutting and, and, and things like that. We didn't know about rotational grazing and, and the energy of grass back then. It's just how Burns would have farmed and done his best when, it, when he used his cows. Although he perhaps never had many cows at the time, it was mainly crops he was growing. It was still really, really interesting as to how he would have farmed. So we decided that we were going to become an organic farm. Uh, we're going to work with very, very closely with nature and, and uh, use what she gave us to, to try and sort of grow our business. Um, and it was a very difficult decision at the time because we, we knew that we were really going to struggle to grow grass for our cows at Miss Gill. You know, but Burns and his brother Gilbert very often spoke about how difficult Miss Gill can be to farm. It's, we're on top of a hill, we've got very wet clay type soils. And uh, we, we do like a, uh, some of the, the rushes cutting about the place. There's plenty of them to keep us, uh, keep us entertained anyway. So it's not the easiest of places to farm. And we're going organic after 40 or 50 years of conventional farming. So the farm itself took a good couple of years to detox, to, to change the, the soil biology from being chemically induced to grow grass into more biologically induced for, through organic farming. So with a few very difficult years of trying to grow grass and keep our cows sustained in that grass, however, We've, uh, we've come through the, the hardest part, we're working away with it and uh, you know, we're, we're now converting grass into, into milk that we're selling all across Scotland. And the great thing about that is we're also working with five other organic farms. So when it just became organic in 2018, lots and lots more people began buying their milk and it got to such a stage that we couldn't physically produce anywhere near the amount of milk we're selling. We're having to unfortunately let people down. But the great thing is because we were organic farming and we knew there was other farms in the area going organic, we managed to approach them and come up with a deal with them to, to supply a fair milk price to the farmers but also keep mosquito milk going out to our local communities. So the great thing about it is, is our, our vision back in 2014 of, of being able to sell our milk direct to the consumer and, and show that a higher quality milk that Robert Burns himself would have tasted is now growing and growing and growing and we're able to supply more people and support more farmers going through too. Very good. Let, let, let me take you back a wee bit, Bryce. There's a, a couple of questions I wouldn't mind asking. Um, can I take you back to, to school days? Um, yeah. where, where did you go to school and, and what were your interests at school? Uh, so I went to Mochlin Primary when I was younger and then to Lake Academy. Um, so when I was younger, I was, I was always interested in cars. I was, uh, although I wasn't interested in farming, I was always very interested in running up and down the woods and trying to hide for dad to, to get out of work. But <laughs> uh, I, I, was, I always had a, a, a bit of an interest in buns. I always, always uh, loved telling my pals that, you know, we, oh, you know I, I run through Robert Buns' fields and things like that when I was in primary. And uh, <laughs> the closer it got to Buns night, although I was absolutely terrible at reciting the poems because uh, I was always... Oh, my mind was always somewhere else, as, as opposed to in a book trying to learn things. I was always uh, very proud to be living right next to the farm anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what did you do? Did you go straight to Mercedes Benz after school? Uh, yes, I did. So, well, I, after school, I had let, I tried to, to get into my fifth year at school and it didn't agree with me. So I think I lasted a fortnight there. Um, and then I decided that, you know, I would go, go back, come back home and I'd help dad for a couple of months uh, to work out what I wanted to do. Uh, so that's what we did, um, and my, me and my father, like most uh, father-son relationships in farms, we never got in particularly well uh, initially. 
And, uh, and I saw this advert coming up saying that Mercedes-Benz were looking for apprentices, so I decided that that's where I was going. And my, my love of Mercedes, uh, that sort of started off with my grandfather. He always had Mercedes uh, back in the day. And uh, I always, always remember thinking that three-pointed star was, was where I would like, as a, as a car I'd like to own. Although not, I haven't actually owned one yet, but a few vans, but not, no car yet. But uh, that's how <laughs> Mercedes started back in the day, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Now, I, I was interested, you were, you were talking about... Uh, being able to to change the farming methods and such like, and obviously, although you were you weren't working on the farm, you must have still had an interest in farming. So I've, I've gathered all that knowledge. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, be, being born on a farm, I said I had no interest, but you know, being born on a farm is a is a very special. Um, childhood that you have, you know, you've got all this space, you get to see the full life cycle, you're always seeing there's animals being born every day, you, you know, they're seeing them eating grass, there's always something happening, there's animals get sick, there's, you, you really appreciate nature itself and, and how, how she works. Um, you know, you, you, are, you are removed slightly from society out here, but then you've also got a great farming network to, to rely upon. I mean, when I was younger, I went to young farmers, there was always great social events and, and learning opportunities. However, quite embarrassingly, um, my first day back, on, I'll never forget this actually, <laughs> um, my, my dad and I were bringing cows in to, to doze them, so we, we have a bit of an issue in the farm with a, a parasite called fluke, which is a, a slug that the, the, the cows can ingest the, uh, the the cows can ingest the eggs of and then that can cause a parasite in their liver, um, and it's something we've not been able to get rid of to this day. However, we, we have that issue, we, we vaccinate the cows every year for it, and uh, the, how, how you do it is you basically hold the animals mouth like that, you use a gun, a, a pour on gun, which puts the liquid in, you put it down its throat and then close its mouth and then that's it done. And uh, I put my hand in this cow's mouth one day and jumped back and went, Dad, Dad, that's, that cow's got no teeth, how can it eat? And Dad was rolling about on the floor laughing and giggling and says, Christ's sake, did you not grow up in a farm? Do you know cow, again, cows have no goat top teeth? This <laughs> 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 man I became a farmer in 2013, so I'd, I'd, as you can imagine, I had a hell of a lot to learn in that time, so yeah. And how, how did you how did you go about that? Was that did, was it learning from books or learning from uh, other farmers or, or how did that happen? Um, it, it wasn't one thing in particular. Um, I mean, when I first came back, Dad was still working away, so I think we had about six months under under my Dad's management anyway. Uh, so I just very quickly had to learn. I, I remember the snippets from when I was younger, you know, working with Dad and Papa in the farm and kind of go, going about and. And things like that, but yes, I, I had a lot of a lot of time with dad that I had to just kind of sit and try and write down as much as I could or follow him about with a, with a video phone at times just to try and uh, just to try and record things he was doing. Um, but believe it or not, um, the medium we're on today, YouTube, is uh, was it was absolutely brilliant. There's a lot of things on YouTube that you can learn. Um, and what I found particularly great was there's actually a lot of small uh, farmers out there, and a lot of small farmers are doing really incredibly, incredibly, incredibly um, interesting things. So I've been following a lot of the smaller farmers who may only have 14 or 15 cows and they're working very much with nature in a regenerative way. So I've been so I look at those videos and reading what they've been doing and just seeing if we can upscale it here at Mesquil. Um, I also went and visited other farms. Uh, but one of the big turning points for me was I actually won a grant with the um, something called the AHDB Dairy, which is the Agri Agricultural and Horticultural Board um, in the UK. And um, and they allowed me to go to the World Dairy Conference in Lithuania back in 2014. Um, so I went over there and I learned an awful lot from, from international farmers and, and sort of dairy processors and people involved in the dairy industry. And I learned a, a lot back over there. Um, that, that was just at a time that they had announced that there was an antibiotics issue in, in animal protein farming, uh, mainly in intensive like chicken and pig units. But looking into that really was really one of the key areas of, of going organic was learning about not using antibiotics constantly in the cattle um, and various other things we're talking about a lot of environmental things that have only really come into the, the media nowadays and um, so a lot, a lot of our farming decisions have been based on going to that conference which was, was a real eye-opener for me but yes I mean the fellow farmers round about I would get around and basically chat the door and say um, is there any chance you could show me how to farm <laughs> and uh, that was how it kind of started for me yeah but uh, I suppose the, the, the other aspect of that is because I wasn't involved in farming um, right from the left of school and I did have this you know time to go away and learn something else it gave me a great grounding for the business I've got today so at Mercedes I had learned all about you know ha handling retail businesses and handling customers and um, also things like customer care and um, marketing is in particular I had just done a marketing course for Mercedes before I had left which helped me greatly with, with my skill today so yes it's, it's got its pros and its cons so yeah <laughs> very good and what about your own family tell us a little bit about about them yep absolutely um so um 
I've got a, a my, my my son Aaron. Uh, he was born in 2015 with my now ex-wife, and um, and today I've got a, a new partner Ashley, which we're engaged, and um, we've got a daughter together called Blair. She was born last April, and then Ashley's got two boys as well, who's Harris and Murray. But um, you know, we, we, they're, they're all they're all a family here. You know, they all in the weekends we've got them all together. Uh, the boys are always outside, running about, chasing the cows, and wanting to help out, and wanting to jump in the tractor, and getting too enthusiastic sometimes about some jobs. But uh, I, it's, it's great to see them growing. And, it's, and you know that that's the thing. Miss Gill is a, a farm that needs a family. It's it's a, a great place to grow up. And I, and I've seen them around the kitchen table on your social media as uh, board of directors. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we call them the board of directors. Yep, yeah. so <laughs> they, they 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 certainly encourage all the decisions that happens at Miss Gill. Um, but uh, and they're certainly we're, we're product testers as well. If we ever think we're, we're going to try a new product, if we ever, ever get a sample to try milkshakes or something, we've uh, we've got Harris, Aaron, and Murray sitting at the table, with champing at the bit, ready to taste it off. So, and, uh, and also they're like, they drinking the profits as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Well, Bryce, um, having been basically lived most of your life in Muskeel Farm, you must have a, a personal association with Robert Burns or his works. Yes, uh, Robert Burns to me, um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, when I was at school, I was always proudest punch to to be living next to Robert Burns' farm and, and running through the fields that, that he once tended. However, my, my sort of Burns interest it wasn't really sparked until I came back to the farm itself. Um, you know, it was always sort of, it's one of those things. If you live in an area that's that's famous for something, you never really take that much attention to to do with it until you're, you're slightly older, unfortunately. And that's how it was for me with Burns, I'm afraid. Um, however, you know, the, the past the past sort of four or five years, I've started really looking into to what he's been what, what he was doing while he was here at Miss Gill in particular and in Malton. Um And you know what? So one of the things that I keep coming back to that that, that Burns really means to me is is his love of nature. When he was when he was uh, and everything he did really, you know, he, he's, he's always famous for his for his romantic side of, side of him, his poems, he's always famous for, for a, bit, a, bit, a bit, you know, outspoken and politically sort of challenging things. However, there's always a side to him that's it's always about nature, you know, give me a spark of nature's fire, it's all the learning I desire. And, and you know, all, all, all these sort of things that come through in his poems, it, it just really interests me how, it, how he, he came to that. And, you know, it's some of the things that, as a farmer as well, some of the things that he comes out in some of his poems, it, it just relates to farming so well, you know, talk, talking about when you're walking through the fields and, and you're seeing issues and you're, see, you know, you're talking about the tea mouse when you're, you're talking about the the link between the, him and the mouse and how nature just is all consuming and, and what's everything around about you, it's really quite inspiring. Um, and even Burns' time at Miss Gill as well, you know, the fact that Burns and Gilbert had moved to Miss Gill to try and start a, a future for themselves and their family after the death of their father, um, you know, their father had died a bankrupt, things weren't going well for the family. Uh, they really wanted to have a better life going forward and they saw Miss Gill as that, he certainly initially anyway, although Robert himself had changed his mind after a couple of years. Um, you know, it's, it's a real connection with me as well, you know, I'd, I'd come home to, to a bit of family grief myself and I kind of saw Miss Gill itself as, as the way forward. That's why we didn't call it Cunningham's Milk or, or Milk from Ayrshire Cows. We called it Miss Gill Milk with Robert Burns' face on it because we saw that was the way forward and we really had this connection between our time at the farm and how it started out and Burns' time at the farm. Um, it really kind of, kind of saw that connection and, and we really wanted to push it forward. And another thing that, that it never annoyed me as such, but I, I just felt that Miss Gill itself, you know, out there in, in the wider Burns network, Miss Gill was always known, but it was never really shouted about. You know, his, his time in, in Alibi is always shouted about. His time in Dumfries, we all know. Um, that, that was obviously where he died and he spent his latter years. And we know about his time in Mochland, but Miss Gill itself, it's, it sh it, I feel it should have been celebrated more, um, perhaps. Perhaps I'm, I'm a bit wrong in that. Some people might disagree with me, but I feel that Miss Gill was, was a real turning point in Burns' life. You know, the Comana condition has come out around about that time. He had been considering. Uh, going away to Jamaica, he, he sort of just parted with Helen Mary, just down the road at, at Felford. Um, you know, it was, it was a real turning point, a real cornerstone in his life, and I just felt that through our brand, through our milk, although we don't shout about it every day, we can always have this odd Facebook post or, or tweet about, you know, Burns did this at Miss Gale on this date and, and things like that. I just I just feel it's uh, it's great to be able to tell that story from standing right in the paddocks that he was he was tending one day. It's, it's a fantastic connection. It's quite clear for the way you're talking, you have the same empathy with nature as Burns did. And when you're quoting for the first epistle to the break and, and to a mouse and these other things, 
you must have read a fair bit about Burns in his life and his history. Uh, yes, I have. I have. Um, unfortunately, and, spe- and especially unfortunately for this video, I'm not the greatest at recite the poems. Um, but I do. I do enjoy reading reading his books. I, I do enjoy reading his poems. I do enjoy reading about his life. I think it's a his his train of thought is just fascinating. You know, when you're, when you're starting flicking through some of these poems and and try to do it as a timeline, is is the particular parts of his life are quite incredible. You, you need to hold Holy Willie's prayer, for example. You just know that his whole life was in turmoil and he's very angry at a lot of people that was going on at the time and. You know, just to, to instead instead of going out there and just muttering under his breath and kicking a stone here and there, he went and put it through his pen onto paper, onto paper, and just you know come up with this incredible legend that he is today. It's it's amazing how he, how he really managed to do that and capture so much of his life and his poetry. Just, I mean, I'm sitting here looking at the, the screen and, and I see the logo, and you've already talked about marketing. How do you see Burns fitting into you know you going forward as a company and, and as a business in terms of your marketing? Are you going to continue to use them? Yes, absolutely. Um, believe it or not, I had a, had a, a meeting with some uh, a marketing company about a year ago, um, and we we're just sort of just sort of putting some ideas in. And they're saying, "What be a logo? We're going to change your logo." And it says, "That's the one bloody thing you're not going to change." So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Burns himself, you know, it's I, I fully see Burns as as being one of the main reasons that we started this skill and sort of tr- thinking about how he went forward and thinking about the fact that, you know, this is the milk Burns would have drank and I get totally excited by that back in the day and thinking, you know, Burns would have been an organic farmer. It's, it's been so, there's been so much of this business has been uh, you know, influenced by Burns himself. And, and even, I, I've made mistakes with the Burns thing as well, um, just to give you an example. Um, we're heard here at Miss Gale are quite unique. We call them the Miss Gale girls. They are Ayrshire cows. Um, and the one thing, that, uh, a couple of things that are unique about them, um, we've left the horns on them, so none of our animals are dehorned at Miskeel. We only feed them grass, we're one of the only farms in Scotland doing that, I believe we're the only dairy doing that. And we also leave the, the baby calves with the mothers as well, um, until weaning, which again, you know, Burns was have done back then because there was no milk powder back then to feed them. Um, and you know, I, I made a, a great big thing about this, but it took us years to plan how to do this. You can't just all of a sudden stop feeding your animals cereals and, and concentrates. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have serious health issues if you do that. So over time, we slowly removed that and became a grass-fed herd and slowly put left the calves on them and let the, their horns grow. And I, I announced one day, you know, what we're doing is that this is the way we're farming and we're going to keep this milk separate. We need a bit of a premium for it because we've lost so much milk production from just feeding them grass and the calves taking so much. So... We did what we call our gold standard milk, and that's guarantees that the cows only eat grass, the calves are with the mills and they keep their horns. And the day that I launched it, I put it on the internet and said, this is great, this is our gold standard milk. The cows even get to keep their horns just like Burns did. And then we're on to me, a primary school teacher from Presswick quickly shot me down and he said, did you actually realise that Burns was one of the advocates for dehorning cattle at the Ayrshire Agricultural Society meetings and quite regularly got angry about it? And here's a link to the, here's a link to the, the document that tells you all about it. So I was uh, certainly put my place that day. Um, <laughs> I really do find it interesting that, that Burns had advocated so heavily for the horns to be removed and it didn't actually happen for about another 150 years until the 50s and 60s in the country. So it just shows you how ahead of his time in agriculture Burns was as well. It's so interesting, yeah. Fascinating. You'll not be the only one to get ribbed uh, with a primary teacher about Burns. I mean, I went to Mothlin Primary in my day and, and, and my music teacher used to rub you properly. Miss uh, <laughs> Anderson did the miss you and hit the wall. But I mean, it, it, it must be exciting. And I mean, I'm a Burnsy and I've been most of my life. It must be quite exciting living in a, a farm where, you know, the greatest ever Scot, according to the polls, live. Does that affect you in any way? Um, it, it does, aye, it does. Um, you know, it's it, it, as I said earlier, it's just it's, it's incredible to be walking through these fields, and you know, I, I can be I can be walking through the fields and totally stressed out because you know something's happened, like saying a, a delivery's been mucked up or, or, or a machine's broken down or, or something's happened, and I'm walking through the field absolutely mad and, and stressed out my brain. And then all of a sudden, you would look over a certain thing and go, "That's amazing." You know, but Burns would have seen that view, and Burns would have been been standing here and he would have been absolutely furious at, at Gina's father for no for not letting the marriage go ahead or, or furious at somebody in the church or, or you know just annoyed at politics in general and and he's walking through his fields and that might have calmed him down and give, given him a bit of inspiration to go and write one of these incredible poems that, that we all know and love today and um, you know it's, 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 it's amazing and you know it actually affects my personal life as well and um, so my, myself and my, my fiance Ashley we actually 
met because of the Burns connection, believe it or not. So um, when we met, she, we had met because she knew that I, I lived at Miss Gill Farm and that was part of her interest. And, uh, and we started talking and Ashley herself, she's actually a primary school teacher and she was very, very heavily involved in getting kids ready for the Bridgeton Burns Club every year uh, when she lived up in Canvas Lang in Glasgow. So, you know, we've both got this Burns connection now and, and I don't know if you saw it on my Facebook page, but, uh, but I did it because of, of the lockdown this year and, and a lot of people can't make it to the Burns Suppers, I thought it'd be really cool to, to do the, the Tea Haggis reciting in one of the bands here at Mesquil uh, for every day online and uh, and I get whipped and I get swore at and I get shouted at for every single word that I never quite got right in the video and <laughs> she's always always keep me right so it's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very special place to live it really is um, and I mean, when people know the connection and find out it's always a great talking point as well. Hey, can, can I ask you a question on behalf of our audience because I'm sure they, they would all want to know having wandered about in the fields and such like do you know the exact place where Burns uh, d decided that he was going to do to a mouse? Unfortunately not, no. It's a question that I'm absolutely desperate to find out myself. Um, we actually, believe it or not, had an email last week from someone who said that, uh, I believe it was their great-great-great-great-great-grandfather uh, was in the field with Burns ploughing when, they, when, when this happened, when this incident happened with the mouse. So uh, well, I'm desperate to find out, but I, I honestly, I'm afraid I don't know, unfortunately. I've, I've, been to, I've been told by other people they do know, but every single person that tells me they do know points to a different field. So. <laughs> but there, there was definitely somebody with him when he was playing, because that's what the second verse is, is all about. I can't see any worry or fear for being him. One look and you can, he's just a wee bit dim. That was, his, he, that was the, the, the boy that was chasing the mouse with the, the paddle. Uh, so and and according to him, when he was interviewed years later, um, he said that Burns actually, once that incident was over, stood at the back of the plough and actually wrote the poem. Is that right? I'm going to show it to him. Aye, it's uh, quite a lot of information in two amounts, but I, as to where exactly it happened, <laughs> quite folk would like to know that. I don't know whatever. <laughs> See, just while you, we're talking about Muskeel and the, and the farm. I take it it would be your, your grandfather and your father were involved when the, the ploughing competition took place there. Uh, it wasn't, but well, at the time, East Mosquil was uh, was tenanted by the Wileys when the ploughing matches yeah. were. But um, my grandfather, he, he, we were all there certainly. I mean, I was, uh, I, I think I was there for the first time and up until like, the last time come down. Uh, I was absolutely amazed that day. There was there was horses going about, and you know, the, the, the steam, uh, the old steam engines were there, and. There was people in the buyer doing old crafts that happened in Burns' day as well. That was it was quite an incredible day that back in ninety six. Um, but no, it wasn't as unfortunate. It was there. It was uh, it was the Wileys that were tending to the mosquito at the time. I think the biggest thing about that day was the the, the, the size of the crowd. I, I remember being in, involved in the planning meetings for it and trying to work out how many fuels we needed to park cars. And I think uh, at, at the end of the day, it turned out that we had to uh, we had to get uh, Mister Wiley to open up about three other fields and the instructions of the police, because otherwise Moxland was going to come to a standstill. <laughs> that right, right. I, was, I, was only, I was only about 10 at the time, so I didn't quite remember on that detail. I just, uh, I just, I just remember the big, the big horses, and, uh, and for some reason I remember someone sp spinning wool as well. I remember that. That was quite an incredible thing. <laughs> but, uh, I, was, I, was, I remember it being a great day anyway, so it was uh, tw 24 years ago now, I think. Right, I, uh, I, I don't want to think about it in these terms, but yes, you're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you, you, you were saying that uh, you've got other ideas, other things you're going to do. One of the things you've started doing is uh, uh, opening up within the within the village of Mockland. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So what, what we have here today is, um, is obviously Ms. Gill, as, as, as I explained, is, is a dairy business. However, over the years, I've felt a, a very strong connection uh, with our community, and I felt that um, we should be really be doing something, something bigger. I mean, Burns himself was a great community man, um, and I think that you know, between that connection and our, our community really backing us when when times were difficult and we were trying to save the farm, and now you know the, the way the way our local community is going as well, and the Burns connection and his history here, I've always felt that we should really be doing something as a business to to really to really work in that. So we've created something called the Mesquite Vision. And the Mosquito vision is something that takes in our social, our economic and our environmental values as a community here in, in Mochlin and East Ayrshire and, and, and all of the team here at Mosquito. We've got 20 people now working for us at Mosquito and, um, and we're all working towards this vision. And this vision is, is, um, is basically trying to 
use what we have in the local economy to try and benefit a local community. And one of the things that I felt very strongly about in Mochlin, I mean, if, if, a lot of people might be watching this from, from outside the area, but in Mochlin, um, the, the village was, was hit very hard back in the banking crisis days of 2007-2008 when our council lost a lot of funding and a lot of funding had to be cut so we lost a lot of community spaces for example we lost our, our, our big library which was reduced significantly and then actually moved into the Burns House in the village um, we lost a games hall and we lost a community centre and uh, just a, f a few other things have been cut and I just felt very strongly that a, lo a lot of community groups like, for example like, like with Burns Club for example they had very limited spaces to where they could go and meet and enjoy community spaces uh, free of charge. Um, I also felt very strongly we had a connection with Speciality Coffee in Glasgow and Edinburgh because of, of our business, because we were selling this, this very different milk into to Glasgow, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And the more I learned about the coffee industry, the more I, I likened it to the dairy industry. However, in, in the coffee industry, it's actually everything's amplified by, by far, far more. Um, so in the coffee industry, you know, the, the coffee farmers over in, a lot of these hot, hotter climates where it's great to grow coffee, some of them can be extremely poor. Some some of them can be so poor that they, they don't know the value of, of money because they're just they get nothing. You know, that's that's the issue. Um so we are now able to work with Scottish coffee roasters who have a very similar vision to us to try and work within food to try and increase quality but also increase fairness. And they're working with farmers across in these third world countries to to buy high quality coffee beans to bring them over to Glasgow and Edinburgh to roast them and then to distribute them to, to Scottish uh, to Scottish consumers. And it's not just happening in Scotland obviously it's happening all over the world, but it was just to give you an example that some of these businesses we're working with uh, supplying their milk to are very ethically driven businesses. So we decided to try and bring this experience down to Mochlin and uh, and what, what we did was we, we opened something called the Moscow Snug and it's actually bang in the centre of the village, it's right at the cross, just two, two or three doors away from, from Burns' house that they, they lived in, Regina Arma. Um, and the, the whole idea of it is to be a specialty coffee shop that we can share this passion that we have for food uh, and working with a Glasgow coffee roaster called Deer Green Coffee. Um, it's an organic coffee. I, today we've got one that's come from Colombia, but previously we've had some from, uh, from Guatemala. We're getting others from all over the world. Um, inside the Snug, we've also got a farm shop, and the farm shop celebrates local producers. So we, we've got local eggs, we've got local honey, we've got local baking, um, we've got local preserves like jam and marmalades and things. So we're trying to support a lot of small um, local food producers. Um, we've also we're working with a, a great bakery as well who's making a very traditional uh, sourdough style loaf so that's the kind of bread that Burns himself may have enjoyed back in the day as well um, and then the third part to our, our snug is a community space as well so what, what we announced was when we opened was that people who, who are members of a community group would be able to use the, the space of the snug for free community meetings at night whenever they wish they would just have to book it with us so they won't charge anything at all for it they can go and enjoy that and, uh, and just use it as, as, as they wish, if you like. Um, and then off the back of that, we've also, because of lockdown, we've not been able to do that because obviously um, community groups can't meet at the minute because of lockdown. So what we did was we tried to rethink things and put different schemes to get people out and about and, and really enjoying the space during lockdown. So people of Mochlin now come to the Snug and we've actually made up these cards. And um, what the cards do is they've got directions on them. And they take you all around Mochlin and all around the, the sort of outskirts and, and all into the roads that Burns himself would have walked and would explain that, you know, this is, for example, one of them, we call it the historic Burns Walk, and it goes up past the uh, past the Burns house, through the cut yard, through the, uh, down past where the Lydon Hotel would be, uh, now called the Fairburn Hotel, uh, down to Failford, through, back up by Miss Gill, down past uh, Highland Mary's Monument, trying to take in all the, the more historic sites, and, and that's been very popular. Uh, we also launched an initiative called uh, fill a bucket and bag a baby and what that means is we've got buckets that lie outside the snug if someone fills it with litter that, that lies about our village they bring it back and we give them a free coffee for their efforts so while people are out, are out getting their daily exercise due to lockdown they can pick up some litter and get a free coffee for it as well so it doesn't even cost them a penny when they're, when they're out and about for their exercise and um, so that, that's, that's that's right in the middle of Auckland and that's something we're working on today um, and of course the Moscow vision isn't just about uh, having a coffee shop in the village uh, the Mosquito Vision is also about shouting more about our, our wider community as well. So we, we really want to to drive up the consumption of organic Scottish milk in Scotland. Um, I truly believe in organic farming. I believe that that's one of the one of the the, the answers to our our future during this climate emergency we're going through. And uh, I feel that the the way that organic farmers can farm. Uh, nowadays, using the technology and using what we know now, we can farm organically in a very efficient way that perhaps Burns wasn't able to do back in the day. 
um, and produce very high quality food. So we want to work with other farmers through a cooperative style agreement so that we can then supply the correct milk price to farmers, a very fair milk price for them then to be able to work with the environment, treat their animals correctly and graze grass as Scotland is great at doing and then deliver that right across Scotland. So that's that's the Miscale vision and uh, we've got a very big ambition to grow the business to be able to do this and get more people drinking high quality organic nutritious milk from the high quality dairy organic farms in Scotland. Excellent. Well, that's uh, that sounds like a great way to finish this. Um, but before we do, um, let me check with Jim. Have you got any more questions for Bryce? Because I've got something I want to ask him. No, not really. I'm just fascinated with the whole process. And uh, I'm really glad that my steel farm is, is, is reaching, you know, a very productive place in, in the burn story now, because the burn story isn't finished and it won't finish because it, it is, as long as we can read his poems, uh, that it, you know, the, his memory will be there. Absolutely. And, and you're helping that memory to, to live on through your your use use of the of the brand. Tremendous. My my question for you: You said that you didn't uh, you didn't recite poetry. You haven't reached that stage yet. But um, there is a member of your family that does recite poetry. Yes, there is. Yes. Um, so my, my fiance Ashley and uh, my my, my stepson Harris. He's uh, he's a, a bit of a superstar. So he is. Well, uh, I was one. I was wondering if there would be any problem in us using his video of, of uh, up in the morning early. Aye, that's absolutely fine. Yep, Harris would be absolutely. And that would let you <laughs> off with needing to recite if we could attach that to this podcast. <laughs> yep, that'd be absolutely fine. No bother at all. Harris would be absolutely delighted. So he would. <laughs> well, that, that would be great, and I think it's uh, the, the poem is very suitable for today's weather. I think so. Yep, I, I, I certainly didn't want to go out, out my bed this morning anyway. So. <laughs> Well, thanks for that. Um, so really just uh, leads me to say thanks very much, Bryce, for, for your time and telling us such a fascinating story. And, uh, and I'm expecting that perhaps in another another period of time there'll be a, a further update to that story and you can come back and tell us more. I think, fingers crossed anyway, yeah. It was, uh, well, it was great to be on today, so thanks very much for the invite. That would be great. Well, thanks very much and, uh, and thanks for giving up your time. Yep, no trouble at all. Telling us about your life with Robert Burns. Thank you. Up in the morning early by Robert Burns. Up in the morning snow for me. Up in the morning early when all the hills are covered with snow. I'm sure it's winter fairly. Cold blows the wind, freeze to waste. The drift is driving surly. Say loud and shrills I hear the blast. I'm sure it's winter fairly. Up in the morning snow for me. Up in the morning early, when all the hills are covered with snow, I'm sure it's winter fairly. The birds sit chattering in the thorn, all day they fear but sparely, and lines the nach fiend to mourn, I'm sure it's winter fairly. Up in the morning snow for me, up in the morning early, when all the hills are covered with snow, I'm sure it's winter fairly.